Hello, folks. Um, welcome to the Grad All Team Workshop Series. Um, today, we will answer the question, how do I prepare my taxes? This session is for international students, and I'm so glad that there are lots of people here today. I know you have questions, and uh, we have answers. In fact, um, our presenter will be answering questions after the presentation. So hold your questions until that time and just share them in the chat. Um, today's workshop is being co-hosted by the Graduate Student Legal Aid Office, the Graduate School, and International Student and Scholar Services. And it has been great working with this team as you know, we're all focused on providing great services to you, our very fine graduate student. My name is Debbie Matetsky, and I am the coordinator of services and programs for graduate student legal aid. I use she, her pronouns. And um, for those of you who might not know, there's a legal aid office on campus. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we provide free legal consultations, um, legal immigration consultations, advocacy consultations, and notary services. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll put our website in the chat so you can go take a look at that and learn more about who we are and what we do and how we are here to serve you. So here's the groundwork for our workshop today. Um, we will share the PowerPoint presentation and the recording this afternoon. Um, as I said earlier, the Q&A will be at the end of the presentation. Um, near the end of the workshop, we will post a link to our six second survey. And really, it takes six seconds. So please take the time to fill that out. Let us know how you thought the workshop was. Um, because we want to offer high quality workshops. So we really do rely on your feedback to make sure that happens. So I'm going to turn the mic over now to Dr. Gabby Gillespie. She is the integration program manager for IFSS. I think she has a few announcements and she will introduce today's speaker. Take it away, Gabby. Thank you, Debbie, and uh, congratulations to all of you that are here today. Taxes is um, not anybody's favorite thing to do, and I am, I'm so glad to see so many of you here, and Sam is going to really provide a lot of the information that you need in order to be successful in your filing process. Um, from the uh, realm of the ISSS office, I just wanted to remind you all that um, our office offers um, a, tax, a Glacier tax prep service. I'll Put this information on the chat for you. Uh, this is just a software that you could use um, to file your taxes. And if you're a non-resident alien for tax purposes, you're not allowed to use third-party services such as TurboTax um, or TaxLayer or any other one of these services to file electronically. So this is one that you could use. I'll put this on the chat and I'm certain that Sam will go over this um, further with you. I'll also provide a couple links to future workshops um, that if you would like to know more about how to use uh, the Glacier Tax Preparation Services, uh, we'll have a workshop at the end of next month. And then a little bit tangentially related today, there's an H-1B workshop uh, with an immigration attorney. And I know that that's a, an area of interest for a lot of our students. So I'll make sure to include that here as well. Uh, if there's anything I can answer in regards to ISSS, please put everything on the chat. Um, again, the or, Presentation today is being recorded, so if you don't want your voice to be recorded, and if you don't want your picture to be on the recording, please go ahead and make sure you cut your video and don't use your mic. Um, it's been, I, taxes filing is very challenging for everyone, and Sam um, has graciously agreed to host a special separate um, workshop for international students because of the unique challenges that you face. Um, so our speaker today is Sam Henberger. He's a CPA full-time lecturer in the department um, in the School of Business here at the University of Maryland. And he has uh, been leading selflessly a group of, it's called a VITA um, tax assistant program through the IRS, which allows help 
for students and scholars and faculty and community members under a certain income to receive um, free tax uh, assistance. So without further ado, he's very well accomplished, extremely humbled, and it is always an honor to work with you, Sam, and, and thank you for giving so much of your time today and always. Um, so I'll turn it over to you. I know you have a lot to cover today. Thank you again. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Glad to be here to help uh, all you international students of my alma mater. I graduated from here some time ago. It's a great school, and I wish you the best of luck in all your endeavors, including your tax compliance. We're, uh, what I, Debbie, I think we'll do is we'll go to my screen first, just for a minute or two, then we'll come back to the quick couple of polling questions. So I'm going to share my screen right this second, and then I'll give it right back to you. And Sounds good. The first uh, screen is just a uh, my insurance company <laughs> just told me, please put this up, to make sure that we don't uh, engage uh, 80 students here today as having a business relationship with my CPA firm in Baltimore, Maryland. And that, that means that you can't sue me or my firm for anything that happens today. You can sue me tomorrow, but not today. All right, first slide. With all due respect to Dr. Gabby, taxes are fun. <laughs> okay. Uh, at least I think they are. All right. Let's just talk a little bit about taxes in general, and then we'll go take a quick polling. Income taxes in the United States is an interesting animal in the sense that it starts with income from whatever source derived. And that would be any income that you can get, unless the tax law says it doesn't have to be included in your income, but almost all income needs to be included. This would include when you work, when you find $10 on the street, that's income, when you deal with cryptocurrency, if you're dealing that way, and whether you sell stock and gain money through Robinhood or uh, through uh, you know, uh, whatever trades you're making, GameStop, et cetera, that's income. And if your circumstances require you to consider that to be income taxable in the United States, if it's sourced to the United States, then it's taxable here. And we'll talk about where you stand with that as we go along. What the United States law allows, not unlike many countries, it also allows for expenses to be reducing your income. We call those deductions. And so you should be very interested if you are gonna be subject to tax, you should be very interested in the subtractions, which we see by virtue of the parentheses. And then we come to something called the net income or the net taxable income. And it's at that point that the tax rates get applied to determine how much tax you owe. And the tax rates will be based on who you are. If you're a US resident or US citizen, we have graduated tax rates. So you pay more as you make more. If you are a non-resident, you're going to, you may have a flat tax rate based on the US law or based on tax treaty. You may have graduated rates depending on the type of income that you have. That's the basic idea of our tax code. We'll come back to the specifics for you international people, but let's go to those little polling questions if we could, Debbie. All right, there you go. There's three questions in this poll. Can everyone see that? And there we go. The answers are rolling in. Thank you everyone for taking a minute to answer these questions. People are still joining in, so we'll keep it open just a few more seconds here. All right, there we go. I'm going to share the results. Okay. All right. Can you see that, Sam? Yes, indeed. Very good. Okay. Great. All right. So this, this seminar is for you. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. All right, we can. Uh... Can I take that away now, Sam? Sounds good, okay. Okay. All right, let's get into the nitty gritty. First of all, based on the poll, uh, this date 415 is gonna be important for you because 
if you've been here prior to 2020 and you haven't filed a tax return of any sort yet, you want to make sure that this April 15th, you start filing something, and not only for 2020, but for other years that you may not have filed with. The good news is for, since most of you are F1, I'm gonna to talk to the audiences if you're all F1, at least for the moment, but we'll cover other visa status uh, situations later. If you are F1, the good news is that you can get yourself in compliance even if you file late. We won't encourage that because there may be a price to pay, there may be a penalty for filing late if you owe taxes. The good news about the United States is they don't charge a penalty for filing late unless you owe. On the other hand, and we'll, we'll, I'll be saying this more than once, on the other hand, you don't want to jeopardize your visa status today by not being compliant. Your visa status requires you as F1, J1, uh, or H1B, it requires you to be in compliance with all the laws of the United States while you're here, including the income tax law. So let's not let's not get too far behind. Let's, catch, let's make this a year to catch up. It's a good year to do it. We have a uh, good staff on our free tax service here at the school to help you if you need the help. And hopefully we'll, with what you learned today, if you can do it on your own, great. Otherwise we're available to help. When it comes to international students in general, there's a, one more famous three digit number besides April 15th, and that is 183. 183 refers to the number of days that you need to be in the United States in order to be considered a US resident, which would change your tax filing status from being non-resident, which you are by default. Before you set foot in the United States, you're non-resident by default. And when you get here, until you reach the 183 day mark, you are can still considered a non-resident for tax purposes. And non-resident tax returns are quite different than we'll just call it resident returns over here. Resident returns follow all of the income tax laws of the US, whereas non-resident are only responsible for US source income. You're not responsible for all of your income the way US residents are. And that's a fundamental difference that I wanna make sure you follow now because it is important, maybe not today for all of you or many of you, but it could be important for some of you who are transitioning from non-resident to resident, meaning you've, go, and we'll learn about how you transition, but one way is you go to H-1B status. When you make that change, you will quickly become a resident with the 183 day rule. And then you are filing this way. And the major difference is this is subject to WW, worldwide income. Let's do that one more time so it's clear. When you're a resident or US citizen, you are taxable on worldwide income. And that means income from wherever you earn it. Could be your home country, could be another country, could be in the United States. When you are over on this side of the fence over here with non-resident, you're only responsible for the US source. So in the event that you're transitioning from non-resident to resident, it's important to keep in mind what that change will mean in terms of your taxation issues for the United States. On the other hand, certain deductions, remember we talked about deductions, are, and we will do this. I'm gonna play the game. I'm not expecting to hear it from everybody, but we're gonna play the game once in a while of the what I call the yay boo game. The yay meaning it's good for taxes, the boo it's not good. Yay meaning we can pay less taxes, boo meaning oops, we might have to pay more in taxes. So uh, the yay game is that when you were at a US resident, the amount of deductions is greater than it is here. This is not as good. This part is not as good as it is here. This is the yay. So we'll say, everybody can say yay when it comes to deductions for residents and boo <laughs> when it comes to deductions for non-residents. Non-residents don't get that many deductions, okay but you don't have to pay tax on your worldwide income and that's a yay. All right, independent of visa immigration status, independent of that is the fact that the days count for what's called the substantial presence test. We'll just put SPT, the substantial presence test. That is, 
independent of your visa immigration status where you count the days to determine if you're a resident or non-resident. However, there are visa statuses where you are allowed for a certain number of years not to count your days. That's pretty important. Not to count your days means that the 183 day rule is not going to apply and you will be considered non-resident U.S. source income tax only during the years that you are this non-resident and under this visa status. So the visa status, as you can see, is F1, J1, and M, and Q. They are going to be considered non-resident for tax purposes. Generally speaking, J1 and F1, if you're for students, if you're students, it's for the first calendar years. And we're going to talk about that. And if it's J, but you're here for as a teacher or a scholar doing research, it's two out of the last six. So let's dive into just a little bit of what that means so you can fully comprehend. First of all, if you're here F1 longer than five, then the 183 day rule comes into a account where you're going to start counting the days to find out when you transition to resident. If you're J1, you're concerned about the two-year rule. After two years, then you'll revert to beginning to count that because during the first two years, it doesn't count the days that you're here. However, we're talking about calendar, calendar years. So, you so why one of the poll questions was, when did you get here? Have you filed, et cetera, because you're gonna to need to start being cognizant of the calendar years that you're here. For example, Suppose you arrived December 31, 2019, and this is 2020. This counts as one year, even though it's a day. This is year two. So now in 2021, you're now in your third year. Had you been J1, you've already used up your two years of not having to count your days. When you get to, J1 gets here under this kind of example in 2021, once they're here past July 3rd, 4th, et cetera, when they get 183 days, they have transitioned to being resident status and that resident status will revert back to the first of the year since it's 183 days or more for that particular year. So that's the type of counting you do. This works for F1 as well, with the difference being it's five years. The substantial presence test, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on that because it's not affecting most of you at this point. Most of you are still either within your five-year period uh, of some sort as F1, or again, if you're J1 and you're a student, you're still within those five years. But the substantial presence test works like this. It's a three-year weighted average for the 183. It's a three-year weighted average. So in the present year, It's 100%. Each day counts 100%. So if you're here 50 days, that counts as 50. In the year before, this, the prior year, we'll call it the prior year, each day counts one third for a number. So it's a, 30, it's a third. So if you're there, oh, let's say 60 days in the prior year, it counts as 20 towards your 183. And then the prior year before that, which is the second year back, I suppose, that's gonna count at one six. So if you're here, oh, 60 days, take one six of that, and that'll be what you count, so like 10 days. So in this case, you can see that they're not making the 183 day rule because it only comes out to 80. But that's how, they get, that's how it gets counted. So when you start that period where you are here past calendar years of five years for F1, this is the test that you're gonna to need to do. You may not remember, but at least when you go there, you'll start recalling, oh, I remember something like that. This is known as the substantial presence test. And that's what I wanted to make clear that when we say, oh, now you'll have to count the days, this is what it means. You'll be counting like that. Find yourself on this chart, <laughs> okay? to see where you are. You know, we've got students, we've got interns, teachers, trainees. 
and you just want to find yourself and say how many years exempt, how many calendar years are you exempt from having to count your days. So in, when you find yourself here, let's say you find yourself as a doctorate student right there, you see that you have five calendar years under that F1 or J1 status. It could be F1, J1. You find yourself having five years where you don't count the days. And that means that during that five years, you are a non-resident. You cannot count the days. You have no choice uh, under normal, so if you're single, you have no choice but to be considered a non-resident. We'll talk later about what happens if you get married to a resident of the United States. Who must file? And the answer to that is basically everyone. Everyone has some type of filing obligation, including all of you non-residents. Certainly a resident has an obligation to file just about every year. There are some exceptions, but a non-resident doesn't have any exceptions. You have to file every year. So if you were here in 2019, even for a day, and you didn't file anything, then come see Turp Tax, come see our program, uh, or pay attention here, you'll find out what you need to do. You're gonna find out you'll need to file what you need to do. And the most minimal part, here it is. Hey, how, you didn't have to wait long. How do, you, how do you like that? I was gonna tell you, you're gonna find out. Well, here it is. The most minimal form you have to complete every year while you're here as an F1 or a J1 is form 8843. 8843, we're going to take a look and see what it looks like, is a form that basically tells the Internal Revenue Service and the U.S. government, hey, guys, this is how long I've been here. These are still within my five years or my two years. I'm still here. I'm not counting my days yet. So the IRS wants to know. They want to know where you are. So at a bare minimum, this form needs to be filed every year. Good news is if you didn't file and you've been here three or four years, you can make up for it now, catch up, file the forms you missed, no penalty. Read my lips, no penalty. So it's not painful to file it. Here's what it looks like. And if you've never seen an internal revenue service form before, and, it's <laughs> and it looks like, holy cow, this form's easy. <laughs> so you've got plenty to, to look forward to if you've never looked at one of these things before. If this, this is an easy one. So you put your name and information up in part one and you'll notice in part one that you put in the actual number of days you're here for a couple of years. And then you find out whether part two or three applies to you and you'll fill in the information there. This is only an information return. There's no tax you're gonna have to pay, no penalty if you're late with it, but you do wanna file it. And as you can see for students, what they're doing down here is here you go. This is for 2020 and look what they got. They got a bunch of prior years where you put in the, the days or not the days, but the types of visa status you had in those years. So this is a way of informing the government of where you are holding in the year, the, the counting of those calendar years. And it's good for you to see it as well. So you can keep track of what, where, where you're holding. All right, so if you didn't have any income, let's stop for a minute. If you didn't have any income, let's do this. If you didn't have any income whatsoever and you um, were here three or four years, there's only one form you really have to file. And that's this 8843. Question is, what does it mean income? And that's what we got to concentrate on because income could be things that you don't think of as income. And that's what we're going to be now. Let's go to that. Let's go back to my screen and let's talk about that. All right. If you received a taxable stipend or grant or fellowship or scholarship, the, the names really are all blended in the our tax code into one tax statute, one tax law. So we, we might say stipend, we might say grant, we might say fellowship. We might say scholarship. They all fall into one category. And that is a, of a taxable nature in the event that these monies are not used for college education, tuition, fees, supplies, 
they could be taxable. They could be taxable. So you may have income and not realize it because to you, it's just a scholarship or it's a grant, but it could be taxable income in the Internal Revenue Code. Now, fortunately, fortunately, many of you will be saved by what we call a tax treaty, which as it sounds is an agreement between the United States and your country. Uh, we have tax treaties with 66 countries. Um, well, I got a slide on that in a second. We, we have tax treaties with a lot of countries and in the tax treaty, we may have actually had an agreement where those scholarships, those fellowships, those grants, those uh, tuition did reduction agreements or uh, benefits that you get are not taxable. So you're, you will need to first consider the fact that this is the statute that is taxable. And then you're gonna need to consider where do you hold with this in terms of the treaty with your country? And so we better say tax treaty may not be taxable. So you'll need to consult the treaty to see what does it say? Great, maybe it's not taxable. However, however, if you get, here's the decision tree. And I know many of you are good with decision trees. So that, uh, cause you're smart students, uh, all of you. So here's how your decision tree works. If I received this, if I received this, given the fact that it could be taxable, except for maybe it's not because of the tax treaty, oops, because of the tax treaty, maybe it's not taxable. I still have to tell the Internal Revenue Service that. I still have to tell them that. This Internal Revenue Service doesn't read your mind or look at all your facts and circumstances and figure out, oh, uh, so-and-so got $10,000 of a tuition reduction grant, but it's not taxable because they're from China and China's tax treaty is not gonna tax it because in the China tax treaty, stipends and fellowships and scholarships and grants like that are not taxable here in the United States when you're F1, when you're a non-resident, when you're, when you're F1 non-resident. So that would be great, except for you need, to, you need to tell the government that. And that's the next step is how are you gonna tell the government that? And so if you've received what could be taxable earnings or income, and that would include things other than the scholarships and other than fellowships, anything else that you received, from the United States, from your school, from a US bank, from a US stock, from Robinhood, et cetera, if you've received anything like that from the United States, you are going to file, let's uh, skip to where it is, because um, I'm a little, you're gonna need to file a tax return. So let's go back. You're gonna need to file and let the government know that. And the way you're gonna do that is through a form called 1040 NR, non-resident. That's what you're gonna do. So that means all the rest of our slides we need to pay attention to because we actually may need to file this. And the rest of the slides are all about what if you have to file a 1040 NR. To do the 8843 that we looked at before, that's a piece of cake because it's just based on, it's just based on you telling the government, here I am and here are how, here's how long I've been here. That's all you're doing. Meanwhile, when you go to do a tax return, the form 1040 NR, now you need a lot more information. You're gonna to have to disclose a lot more detail. You still may not have tax to pay. That's what I'm, that's the good news. That's why not, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to file this. All right. So let's talk about other reasons why we wanna file this report, this 1040 NR. Sometimes your income from the United States is subjected to a tax before you file your tax return. Sometimes your income is subjected to what we call withholding tax. So you might have, oh, let's say um, dividends from a stock on the US stock market. And you're certainly allowed to do that. And when you receive your dividends, it's been subjected to, oh, I'll put down maybe a 10% tax or it could be 15%. It depends on the treaty, the, the default rate is 30%, but your tax treaty with the United States may reduce that. So now you've paid a tax on this income and you, 
you didn't even have to pay it. It was done for you through the withholding tax. The neat thing about filing a tax return is you may actually get the money back. You may not owe that tax. When you file your 1040 non-resident return, you may be able to get a refund and that's good news. Why, why let our US government have a tax-free donation from you <laughs> have a th when you don't need to do that? All right, so here's, this wraps up what we just spoke about, a little bit of a summary. As a non-resident, withholding tax may be applied to some or all of your payments at a rate of 30% or lower, depending on the tax treaty. We have treaties with 66 countries to reduce this or to even exempt it. And in the event that your income has been subject, subjected to a withholding tax, be diligent, file your return, which you need to do anyway, you need to do anyway, but do it with the incentive. Do it with, hey, let's get American here. Let's do it the American way. Do it with the incentive of getting a refund. All right, maybe you, you won't be that lucky and you'll owe a dollar or two, but you'll still be complying with the law, which you must need to do with your visa status. All right. All right, what tax documents are you going to need? If you need to file this 1040 NR, have any US income whatsoever, or even a scholarship of some sort, you're gonna to need to file it, so what do you need? Well, if this applies to you, you'll need your W-2. W-2 means you worked for somebody, you were earning money, you got paid a salary, you got paid wages, and you'll need to present that for your return. It looks like this, just for the record. Notice the IRS is really on the ball today. They're already out with the 2021 W-2s, but they look the same as 2020. They put very interesting information in the Sam, form. I'm sorry yes. to interrupt you, but it's causing a little bit of confusion for the students. Can you explain why does it say 2021 here and why do the forms that we file say 2020? Yes, this is, I was just explaining, thank you for the question. I was just explaining that when I pulled this off the internet, I didn't realize that the Internal Revenue Service was already publishing the 2021 returns for W-2s. So let's just substitute that and say this is 2020. It looks the same for 2020, it looks the same. So th that's, that was, <laughs> I'm glad you asked the question because I was as fascinated with that as you are when I realized what I had copied from the Internal Revenue Service. They are on the ball this year, which may be a subliminal message to all of us, don't fool around with the Internal Revenue Service these days. So they've already published the 2021, but the 2020 would look the same, does that help? Um, yes, and then just a reminder to everyone on the call that we file our 2020 income or presence on or by April 15th of 2021. So that's kind of a little bit of the confusion on the chat was the numbering on the forms not matching up to our current year. Okay, so let's undo that because that's a great question that U.S. citizens don't think about because we're so used to it. So let me go through. You have a calendar year you just completed, so we'll put a box around it that 2020 is done. In order to prepare and file your tax return for 2020, the return, the 1040 NR, will say 2020. It's due April 15th of 21. That's how we work. Hope that clears that up. Not to... Thank you so since, much. <laughs> no problem. Since I love to confuse my students, I do it all the time. I uh, will let you know that if you're out of the country, if you're actually physically out of the country, your due date is 6-15-21. And what does that mean? If you're out of the country on this date, you are now given an automatic new date of 6-15-21 to file. The returns will all say this date, 2020, because that's the year you're filing for. But the year when you file it will be in 21. So that's good. I, Gabby, Debbie, I like what's going on. Let them, let me know when I'm saying something that is beyond, <laughs> it's like, it's second nature to me, but it's not second nature to someone who hasn't been here yet. I'm explaining what is more complicated than American baseball, um, but I grew up with it. So I'm happy to get these questions. It's great. And if you try to explain baseball to a non-American, and I have, it's not so easy to do, just as it's not so easy for our British friends to explain cricket to me. All right. Okay. 
Moving along a little bit. So let's go back to the W-2. So now we, now we can say that the W-2 here is really a 2021 W-2 for you. You will only receive W-2s at this stage that would say the, the year 2020 for that year. It's what you earn as a salary or wages that year. And they give you that information, how much you earn, so you know how much to report on the 1040 NR. This would be U.S. sourced earnings. That's what it would be, U.S. sourced earnings. You worked in the U.S., you were working for a U.S. employer for your school. Maybe you were a GA, maybe you were a, uh, doing research or teaching. And this is what you will have received. They'll also tell you how much income tax was withheld. Again, that's an important number, not so much for the fact that you are concerned that that they would, how, could, how dare they withheld that money? They're allowed to, that's the law. They do have to withhold the money. They do pay the tax for you out of your earnings, but you're concerned about that X because maybe that's too much for you. Maybe when you do your 1040 NR, it will show you you don't owe all that money. Again, that's the refund, that's the yay. Yay, we might get money back. The other thing of importance on here is that also down in this box here, they'll show you what state you worked in and they'll show you how much they withheld for state income taxes. And it's the same thing will apply here that these numbers that were withheld as your income tax, based, those withholdings by the way, are based on guesstimates. There are tables, but they're based on guesstimates of how much they think you would owe based on how much income shows on the W-2. So those estimates could be wrong. They could be too much or too little, but most of the time they're a little too much. And so you do have a fairly good chance of getting a refund back. Of all, here's an interesting statistic, which hopefully will convince you to file your 1040 NR. Of all the tax returns filed in the United States, of all of them, 75% approximately result in refunds to the taxpayers. Now that's a good bet. That's a good bet to roll the dice and see where you fall. And if you owe money, that doesn't mean you can take your bet off the table. You still have to file the return and pay what's owed. Otherwise, you don't, your visa status may be in trouble someday. One other box to make a note of here is what's called social security wages, box three, box four, social security tax withheld, Medicare wages and tips, Medicare tax withheld. We will, I'm probably gonna talk about this one more time, but for the, for the moment, you need to understand that if you're F1 or J1 and you're within that five or two year period, depending on student or teacher status, these boxes should be zero, should be zero. So in the event that you're sitting at home right now and you're looking at your W-2 and you see there's numbers in those boxes and you are F1 in your first five calendar years, then stay tuned because we're gonna talk about what, ha what you do when that happens. See how much information you can get from these forms? I love it, it's so much fun. All right, another form you need. So far we've talked about forms you need. You need a W-2, now we're gonna talk about the 1042S. 1042S comes from your school or your payor of your stipend, fellowship, grants, or other types of income that aren't earnings. So if you have somebody who's sponsoring you and paying you some money to help you go to school or help you live here in the United States, they are going to file a 1042S and that is gonna show you how much they paid you during the year. And it's also gonna show you whether or not it's taxable based on how they file it. This is what it looks like. Didn't, didn't I tell you the forms are gonna get looking worse? <laughs> this is no joke. Look what they got here. They got income codes. They got chapter three and four. What happened to chapter one and two? I didn't even see chapter one and two. Where's the prologue? I didn't get a chance to see. So, and then they got exemption codes and they got tax rates. This is going to be, in most cases, just showing you how much you were paid. And when they show you a exemption code and no tax rate there, it means that it's not taxable. How are you gonna know that? There are instructions that come with the 1042S that you can read to help you interpret it. Now, if you're saying, I'm never gonna get through this, so I have an answer for you right now, which we'll come back to a couple of times. 
if you're saying, there's no way I'm gonna get through this on my own, here's your immediate answer, which, <laughs> and that is you'll come to Terp Tax. I'll show this slide again so you can get the, uh, you can get this information down clearly for you to use, but that's, that's gonna be helping you in that event. All right, back to our 1042S. Again, what this form is showing you is what usually has been paid to you typically where it's not taxable. And what the codes are gonna be saying is the codes are gonna be saying why it's not taxable, either under tax treaty or some other reason it's gonna explain that. In the event that there's a tax rate shown and in the event that there is an amount of withholding, which would be better illustrated here, federal tax withheld. So if there is some amount here, that means this amount is taxable. You are gonna to need to put it on your 1040 NR and you're gonna to have to be aware of that whatever tax has been withheld, maybe come back, maybe it comes back as a refund, maybe it doesn't, but you're gonna to have to disclose that on the 1040 NR. Even if the information seems to indicate that there is no taxable amount because there's no, because it's a zero on there and they got exemption codes in here. Even if that's the case, again, you need to show this to the federal government by filing the 1040 NR. They won't look at your 1042 S and say, oh, you didn't need to file because all of it was exempt. They're not gonna do that. You need to file it and disclose it through the 1040 NR. So that's gonna require you now to be in that situation where not only do you have to file the 8843, but you got the 1040 NR that you have to file as well. I'm pausing a little bit in case there's anything else that came up in the chat box that I'm not looking at. Uh, there are lots of questions around the W2 and for it. If you are employed by the University of Maryland, where might you go to access that information? Okay, that's a good question. You should have received it by now. And if you didn't, then I assume maybe Debbie, uh, you can help me. Is it online uh, for the students? To, to, can they access it online? You know, I got, I got mine in the mail um, to the address that's on file. So I, I would suggest that students contact their, their supervisor um, or the HR department. Sounds like a good plan. Yeah, sounds like a good plan. Check with the supervisor, check with the HR. Uh, they are probably already there for, waiting for you. The Terp Tax fellows, fellows, the Terp Tax students and volunteers that I work with actually may have been able to answer that question because they've heard that story before and they think they some many of them are international students themselves so they know where to go so check check that's a good idea check there and hopefully you'll be able to find your your w2 right are, and it, it looks like gabby and amanda are posting um a location where you can get your w2 online so everyone look in the chat for that um sam there's another question um about the 1042S, who is that for? Can you reiterate that? Yes, that is, well, it, it will be in your name. It will come to you. You will receive it if you're getting your stipend and your fellowship from the University of Maryland, you will get it from there. And it's, they, are, they are required to send it to you by March 15th. So you may not have received it yet. And I assume that the online spot for your W-2 is probably similar for getting your 1042S to find it there. So it is for you, the student who has received this payment. Does that help answer that question? I think so. Okay. Thank it will, you. It will come to you. You will get it in the mail. It will show you what applies to you on this form. Okay. Thanks, Sam. All right, no problem. I like what we're doing. Keep the chat. Keep the chat box. You know, let me know what you see. I'll be glad to stop and answer. Other forms that you might get, you might get. Again, this should be 2020. Uh, you might get a what's called a 1099. 
That's what it's called, 1099. There are a variety of 1099 forms. This one's 1099 miscellaneous, as you might see. You have 1099 dividends, DIV. You've got 1099 interest. And there's a whole slew of other kinds of 1099s you could get. These forms, 1099s, are showing you other types of US source income that you receive. If you receive this, it means it's US source. You won't get this uh, for non-US source income. That should not happen. So if you have other US source income that you have to be concerned about reporting, that will come on forms like this. Most of, most of you will not receive this form, but just in case, now you know this is needed for your tax return. How are we doing so far? Good? Doing great. Okay. Here's another 1099 form. How do I know? Look down there. 1099. It's called 1099 NEC, which, which stands for, as you might see from the acronyms up here, non, the N, non-employee compensation, non-employee compensation, which just means that somebody paid you the payer will be listed here, and here's you, this is you, and it'll tell you how much they paid you in non-employee compensation, meaning money that you didn't earn through employment. You didn't earn it through employment, meaning you weren't an employee, non-employee. That's the name, non-employee. I was not an employee. I was. Anybody guess on what the name would be? If you're not an employee, what else, how else do we describe that in English? Independent contractor. Oh, that sounds pretty fancy. Independent contractor, like a consultant. That's a great, a great name for it as well. Independent contractor or consultant. If you receive this form, you have to, you, you have to seek assistance, maybe from our school, from Debbie, from uh, Gabby. Uh, maybe some, some other people, you need to seek some assistance, maybe from your, your general um, supervisor when it comes to your visa status, because under my understanding of F1, and I'm not a lawyer in, in dealing with F1 status visas, I'm not an immigration lawyer, but my understanding is an F1 or J1, or most of the other types of visa status that would apply to the body of people we have here today, students in our school, you should not get this under that status. It is generally not allowed and it could be compromising your status. So how can it happen that this happens? That's a good question. And it could happen because you go get an internship with somebody and they don't know what they're doing and they put you on this independent contractor place and you shouldn't be there. So if, this, if you get a form like this, start asking questions to your to people that you know in school, Debbie and, and Gabby, and find out, was this allowed under your visa status? You can get this corrected. So that, that's why I'm saying find out because you can get it corrected by whoever hired you. There's another one. All right. So, so far we've covered a lot of ground, which is good. So we can move along. Scholarship for tuition we talked about. Uh, these are all types of things that could be income. And most of the things on this list may not actually be taxable to you because of the fact that some of it's not even U.S. source. For example, money from your home country is not U.S. source, so you don't have to pay tax on it. This will not, you won't have to pay tax on savings accounts income, but you do have to report. So if you have almost any of the items here, you're going to need to file a 1040 NR. All right, so the items needed when preparing return, I think this is for summary purposes. Oh, this is for when you, if you were actually going to prepare your return, and use the Terp tax or any other uh, service that might help, whether it's online or, or, or wherever, you're gonna need income documents that we spoke about. So we already talked about that. You'll need at least a copy of your passport. You'll need at least a copy of your visa. You'll need to know what dates you came in. And if you left the country at any time, you're gonna need to know when that is. And if you have social security number or ITIN number, you're gonna need that. So these are the basic ingredients of getting your 1040 NR prepared. Non-resident spouse and dependents, 
All right, so they also, if they're F2 or J2, they also need to follow the same rules that we spoke about for you. They have the same calendar year rules. They have the same filing requirements. However, they have to file on their own. There is no such thing as joint returns when you're under these statuses. This summarizes it, same filing requirements as the F1 or J1, no joint returns, the obligation is same, same deal, 8843, they have to file it every year. They may have to file this if they have any income whatsoever. And don't, file, don't mail them all together. Most of the time you're gonna e-file anyway, but don't mail everybody in one envelope. The IRS doesn't understand that. Deeper topic, non-resident can elect to file as a resident when married to a tax resident. So if you're married to somebody who is a US citizen or a US resident, you have extra options. I'm not gonna go into all the details right this second. You have extra options. Maybe you, can, maybe you can file a joint return, which is to your benefit, to your benefit in most cases, not always. That's why I can't go into it in all detail. It has to be analyzed by a basically a tax professional to determine whether or not it's good for you or not good for you. But it's an election, you get to decide, do I wanna file with my married US tax resident person, spouse or not? All right, I told you we'd come back to this FICA taxes. That's the social security tax and Medicare tax that I mentioned on the W-2 where I said as F1 and J-1 for the years that you're not counting your days, you shouldn't be paying that. And if there's a problem and it's withheld and you have been paying it, then you have to go try to get it corrected. So non-resident international students and scholars do not pay, should not be paying those two taxes. The, the name for those two together is FICA or FICA. That's how we, we say it in the United States. So those two together, we call that, you should not be paying those. If you transition to H-1B or your J-2 or other types of visa holders, then you are subject to those taxes. Okay, fine. Um, but most of you are not in that position. And it would only be when you're doing off campus because the University of Maryland payroll system, they know that you're not supposed to pay those taxes. So if you're a GA or a researcher and you got a W-2, you will not see taxes in those boxes on that W-2, you're in good shape. But sometimes when you do an internship or work off campus, then sometimes the employers make a mistake. You can get that money back. First, you go to your employer and you ask for it, ask for it nicely. And if they say no, you, you ask them to give you a little bit of a letter saying that they're not gonna go get it back. And then you can file with the government two forms in order to get those taxes back. This we have at Terp Tax, we have a one page form that describes each step that you have to follow. Uh, Debbie, uh, Gabby, just let me know and I'll send that to you and you can send it out to everybody so they can see the steps that you do in order to get those taxes back if they've been taken from you. ITIN number, we won't talk about that right now. It's required when filing a return if you don't have a social security number. It's not needed on the form 8843. So if you got no income, no scholarships, no fellowships, no grants, nothing, nothing, you won't have to worry about it. You can still file the 8843 without a social security number or an ITIN number. ITIN number means individual taxpayer identification number. And it's in lieu of social security number if you don't have a social security number. So, um, scholarship recipients usually will have a number already. So you don't, have, you don't really need to worry about that. Usually through your scholarship, they've taken care of giving you that number and that makes life a lot easier. One more form of interest is the 1098T tuition statement, which for US residents, for US residents is used to claim the education tax credit. It causes uh, a lot of issues with non-residents because they don't understand what the 1098T is doing when they receive one, which you will receive. And the thing is that you can't claim this. Non-residents cannot claim the education tax credit. You're still gonna get the 1098T because the school is required to, to give you one. But if for you, it's usually going to be meaningless. It's usually gonna be meaningless because 
mo it's not likely that you're going to pay tax on your scholarship, fellowship, or grant because it's most likely that you're covered by the tax treaty. So let's just summarize that because it's very important before we move on. And that is in most cases, the 1098T, which they'll give you, which shows how much tuition you paid is not gonna be relevant to you. You can't use it for a tax break. You can only uh, soak up the information of what, how much tuition you paid, which you may have been paid by your fellowship or your scholarship. And it's usually, your scholarships, and I'll just put one word, say scholarships and et cetera, usually, usually they're not taxable because of treaty, but they could be. So as a final summary there, check the treaty. State taxes, Every state that you will live in or could live in here in the United States, except for a few, have individual income taxes as well. They do not have non-resident um, rules like F1. If you're there 183 days in a state, you will be a resident. They do not follow tax treaties. They do not follow the federal law when it comes to substantial presence tests. Uh, because they're not following the tax treaties. So if you're in Maryland 183 days in a calendar year, you will be a resident for state tax purposes. And they would like you to file a return in the state as well. The rules change from or vary from state to state, that's true. So you're gonna need to get their instructions online and that's state taxes. If you missed a year, this is a summarization. File, if you file as a resident by mistake, what do you do here? Let's talk about these questions. What if you missed a year, you didn't file for a certain year? What if you file as a resident by mistake? You're an F1 and you filed a 1040, not a 1040 NR. What if you did that? You can go back and fix it. Go back, file if you didn't file it before, fix what you fixed, fix a 1040 to a 1040 NR. It's not a difficult process, but do it, fix it. File what you didn't file and fix what you made errors on. You can only claim refund for the previous three years, but many in this audience were probably within that, so you could still get a refund. So there again, make it, make it a fun game. Hey, let's file for what I didn't do. Let's correct what I didn't do. Maybe I'll get a refund. Maybe I'll get money back. So that's what we're talking about. This is easy, simple form, use 1040X to change from a resident form to the 1040 NR. If you misfile, misfile means you filed as a resident. Typically, as was said by Gabby early, if you use TurboTax in any of the prior years, you missed filed. So let's just put that down. And then we're about to wrap up. If you ever use TurboTax, you missed filed. Innocently, but you did. All right, summarization. You're required to comply with all US tax laws, including the IRS. It's part of maintaining your visa status in the United States, could affect your future immigration status. Bingo, fines, penalty, interest can accrue if you owe the IRS money, but the IRS is also nice and they may abate. They may be able to abate. You can say, look, I didn't know what I, I, I spoke to Sam Handwerger, the professor, and he told me something wrong. You could use a lot of good excuses and you may be able to get a penalty waived. But the main thing is you might be missing out on a refund and that you don't want to do. Also, lastly, and then I'm going to take, we're going to look at all the questions. Watch out for tax scams. This year, more than ever, there are fake emails. There are fake phone calls that are going out that are claiming to be from the Internal Revenue Service. And they'll say you owe money or they say you need to do something. You need to do it right away or you're going to jail. If you ever hear that in any way, if, even if they knock on your door and they say we're from the Internal Revenue Service and if you don't do something right away or you're going to go to jail, you need to make a payment to avoid jail time, don't believe it, just contact me. I mean, that's, it's, it's a scam. So don't worry about that. Okay, now we can do questions. Are there any questions in the chat box you want to do first before I look at the uh, email? Yes, we, there are many questions in the chat and Gabby is um, going to feed those questions to me. Okay. Thank you so much, Gabby.
Okay, first one. Um, I am on an F-1 visa, which would make me a non-resident for tax purposes. My husband is on a green card, is a green card holder, which makes him a resident for tax purposes. Can we file a joint tax return? You can, it's, a, it's an election. Like I said before, it's an election. You decide whether you wanna do it or not. And the election is, is something that um, if, if, you, a w, if you send me uh, an email, I can send out what the election looks like. Uh, if someone wants to do it themselves, otherwise at Terp Tax, we know how to do it. But you need to send in a little form saying I'm electing under code section 6013G that that's what I want to do. And you can file a joint resident return. You need to just consider what's my worldwide income? What will, what will that mean to me? Uh, there are considerations that you should go through with it. I personally feel with a tax professional or turf tax, you should go through with them. Sounds good. Thanks, Sam. Okay. Uh, next question. Do you still have to file taxes even if you claimed exemptions? If you are working or getting scholarship or fellowship or any kind of income from U.S. source whatsoever, although some tax people might say if you're not working and you don't have any other U.S. source income other than tuition reduction uh, uh, or scholarships, you may not need to file. My advice is don't take a chance file anyway to make sure that you show the tax treaty on your return applied to you and, and so none of it was taxable. Uh, the answer is, I think, I think personally, don't fool around with your immigration status file. All right. Uh, next question. Do I need to apply for an ITIN in order to file taxes? If you have to file the 1040NR, you will have to do that. You, you absolutely will. If you only need to file the 8843, you do not need to. Okay. I received a 1099 NEC from my internship in January 2020, where they did not withhold taxes. Where, when do I pay my taxes for that income? And is that something that is handled when I file my tax returns this year? Yes, uh, the taxes will be paid when you handle the tax return this year, when you file your 1040 NR, if that's your status. Uh, as F1. And as I said, I think the first thing to do is to make sure that that is not going to be a violation of your visa status, that you were allowed to do that. Uh, as an independent contractor consultant, very important to check that first before you file the return and then take it from there. Okay. Uh, next question. It, uh, let's see. Okay. Someone who arrived in the U.S. in December 2020. Um, do they have to file taxes by April, this, this April 15th deadline? That's a great question. And the answer is they probably, if they just arrived in December, the chances of them having, quote, income from scholarships or any kind of earnings or any other U.S. source income is probably nil, although it's possible. But assuming they arrived and they have no U.S. source income, all they have to do is file the 8843. But they must file the 8843 even for one day in December of 2020 by April 15th of 2021. All right. Thank you. Um, so we need both the form 8843 and the form 1040. NR, non-resident, most 1040 likely. 1040 NR. Yeah, okay. unless... Unless your status as F1 is over or you're over your five years. If you went over your five years and you meet the 183 day rule, then it would be a 1040. Okay. Uh, can we ask the employer to withhold an exact amount rather, rather than the employer withholding a higher amount and then claiming returns later? Yes, you can do that. You can work with your employer to modify the withholding. Some employers are a little bit easier to get along with that way than others, but you are certainly allowed to do that. All right. Um, all right, so here's a student that worked as a TA and a GA with a financial scholarship during 2020. Will they be sent a 1042S by the university? And if so, when? So if, if they will receive it by March 15th, that's when they're due. 
They're due to be given to all the recipients by March 15th. And they worked as a GA, TA, they should get a W-2 for that. That we spoke about, uh, maybe they need to go online or check with their um, supervisor on where that is. That they should have already received. Okay. Um, here's a student who had received an internship salary without any withholdings. Which form must they get from their employer? Hopefully they'll get a W-2 even without withholdings, that's okay. Hopefully it'll be a W-2. Now, if they get that 1099 NEC, that's where um, I'm concerned about that with our F1, J1 visa students. So they'll need to follow those rules about, hey, check that out. Where are you allowed to do that? And chances are you were allowed to work there, but there may be a greater chance that the employer, the internship -er, the internshipper, I don't know if that's the word, the internship source, <laughs> <laughs> misclassified you and they need to correct that so you don't get into any issues with your visa. You don't want to let that, if you weren't supposed to be an independent contractor, don't let that hang until you start trying to get H-1B. Get it fixed now. All right, thank you. Um, here's a student who says they are getting um, an international fellowship from India. Is that taxable? Definitely not. Not here. As long as assuming that you are a F1 or J1 in those that, that five year period that we spoke about, definitely not. Okay, that's good news. Yeah. Uh, okay, next question. On my form 1098T, there seems to be a student's TIN. Is that my ITIN? Do I need to apply for one in order to file? Wow. So, so if they um, if they actually um, you uh, Gab did Gabby put something in there? Let me just see something. Uh, can you say what, what it is and I'll put it back because there's the, the chat's crazy. I've been putting a lot of stuff. Oh, OK. <laughs> oh, I see 5000 postings. I'm going to skip that for now unless there's something you want to add. Well, you tell me what you want me to put it back on there and I'll put it back on the chat. <laughs> I don't know. Let, well, I'm going to I'm going to pass on that because it would take me that 20 minutes to read. Uh, so I, can, I can I can I can repeat that question if you want. Okay. Yeah. So uh, under my my 1098T form, there's yeah. a student's I, TIN number under that. So is that my IT number? That was yeah. actually the, the question. I would yeah I would say so. They they, they didn't pull that out of the, the sky. The uh, whoever wow. prepared that yeah. Do, do you know, uh, sorry, do you know where can I get that number from? Because it is, it's a block with X only showing the last four digits. Oh, so did it come from the university, uh, Maryland? Yes. I, yes. Would, I would suspect that you could, uh, get again, get it from, from uh, the sources, the uh, Bursar's office. You, you may have to present yourself in a way where they know you who you are and why you're asking for it, but you should be able to get it from them. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. All right, Sam, next. I have received my W-2. It only includes my earnings and not tuition remission I received as a part of my GA. Does that tuition remission need to be reported um, as it is not a scholarship or grant? So you won't see that on the W-2 because that's only for earnings. The tuition remission may show up on your 1098T in box five. It may be reported there. And it other, otherwise may show up on the 1042S. But if you don't see it anywhere, don't worry about it because there's no requirement that it gets reported. And number two, as we've, I've been saying, most likely wherever country you're from has a treaty from the, with the US that says it's not taxable anyway, as long as you're under student F1 or J1 status. So if that's you, don't, don't worry. Uh, it should not be on the W2, so that's right. And you may not receive anything uh, reporting it, but it, you're supposed to do your own accounting. So let's say you're from, oh, I don't know, Transylvania, and we don't have a treaty with Transylvania. So, and you're a, you're a count or countess. Uh, and you're supposed to do your own reconciliation or your own accounting of what scholarship or tuition reduction you got, tuition remission to see if it's taxable or not. 
So that won't get reported in many cases. So don't worry about if you didn't see the reporting, but just, just check the treaty of your country. If it's not taxable income anyway, no sweat. I'm going to interject for a second, Debbie, one second. Can we just step Please. back for a moment, Sam? Can you talk about TERP tax, what it is? Because I think there's a lot of confusion that the students on the call are going to go and do this by themselves and that they have to remember what these forms are and which one they should fill out. And I just want to make sure that we're, um, maybe I could share my screen or Debbie or you and just show the website or how they make that appointment. Um, please. I beat, <laughs> I, beat, I beat you to it, I think. Do you see my screen? Yes, yeah. of course. <laughs> okay, so let's describe TERP tax. First of all, TERP tax is free. So you need not fear about getting a bill. We will not bill you. We are all volunteers. We are all certified. These are, when I say we, it's made up of about approximately 70 or 80 students at the Smith School of Business right here on the College Park campus. Of course, they're all virtual. So we, some, many of them are in who knows where. I don't even know where they, they won't, they won't tell me where they are. I just see them on Zoom. <laughs> Nevertheless, these students are standing by waiting for you to make an appointment on the website. And what you do is you'll make your appointment. They'll have on that website the forms that we spoke about. So what today is all about, today is all about showing you what the process is. So at least you're familiar with it. You should never do things blindly. You should have some idea why you're doing what you're doing, but you can let TurpTax do the whole thing for you. We will prepare the federal return 1040 NR. We'll prepare the 8843 if you don't already, if you haven't already done so. We'll do that. We'll do your state taxes. So you can get a one-stop shop free at TurpTax. Uh, we're not here to sell it because we don't get any money and the volunteers, uh, the, uh, the volunteers get great experience. So I don't want you to feel bashful about using it. You have to understand that these students are business students and they're looking oh forward God. to getting the experience from you uh, and, and serving our illustrious school. I'll show that again a little later. So please help, help yourself. And I'll, I'll be, I'm there, I'm the supervisor, so to speak. So in the event that you have a unusual question, they will consult me and you can always ask them, could you please consult that crazy Professor Sam so that I can find out more about this issue. All right, but I have some questions on the email. Should I go through those or you have more, Debbie? Sorry about that, I was muted. Um, we, we do have more questions in the chat, so let's do those first. Okay. Um, I will make sure that we encourage everyone who submitted a question to follow up with TurpTax. Okay, great. Okay. Great, please. Uh, all right. I lost my place. Just a second here. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. So it's, I received a 1099 G form. What is that for? Oh, that was on the, the uh, email. Very good. That is for your refund of your state income tax from a prior year. That may or may not be taxable. You, you, the way you'll know if it's taxable now in 2020 is look back and see if it was ever deducted in a prior year. Remember those words, deductions we spoke about? See if you ever deducted it in 2019. That's probably where it comes from. It will tell you on the 1099G which year the state tax refund is for. It was paid to you in 2020, but it'll tell you if it came from the 2019 return or the 2018 return. And just look back to that, fe that state return to see it, to that federal return. Look back to the federal return to see if you got a tax deduction for it. If you did, then you have to pick it up as income now. If you didn't, if you don't see it deducted anywhere, it's not income today. All right, thanks, Sam. Uh, next question. I wasn't employed in 2019, so I didn't file any taxes. I received my W-2 for 2020. Do I need to fill in an additional 8843 or just one this year with the mention of 2019? So each year, 8843 has to be filed on its own. So I think that answers the question you were F1, let's say in 2019, if you didn't file that 8843 for that year, you should file it for that year. It, each 8843 is labeled for the particular year. Okay, thank you. 
And um, the eighty and the eighty eight forty three that he wants to file, he or she wants to file, is labeled twenty nineteen for twenty nineteen, and then twenty twenty for the twenty twenty year. Got it. Okay. Um, I haven't received my federal tax refund of twenty nineteen. Do I need to refile the tax return for twenty nineteen? What should I do to get the refund? Oh. Um, you should probably, well, refiling is not a bad idea just to, in case they didn't get it, but I can tell you a couple things. One is the Internal Revenue Service is definitely behind sending out refunds for 2019. It's because of the pandemic. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say be patient. I would, you could call, you'll be on the hold for a little while, but you could call to find out. You could um, send in for a transcript to find out if they have the 2019 or just simply send it in again. Uh, personally, I would, pref since I don't like to be on hold for a long time, I would just probably send it in again. Uh, if, if you send it in by mail, you can expect a three, four month delay before they'll even get to it. It's unfortunate, but that's where they're holding. Hmm. All right, by thank the, you. I, by the way, before the next question, with those students are, that are here, you should not be receiving any of the stimulus monies. If you received stimulus money, that's an indication that you filed a incorrect form. If, in other words, if you're F1, J1 and you have not passed that five years and you're definitely non-resident, you filed the wrong form. Uh, and that's why you got the stimulus check, stimulus check. You need to send that back and you need to refile for the years you misfiled. Now, if you were filing as a 1040 resident, that's a different story. Then you, were, you may have been entitled to get that stimulus check. But that's real important. Don't mess up your visa status because of that. All right, and Turf Tax can help students with that. Absolutely. Great. Okay. So if you are F1 student with a scholarship and no other income, you just have to file the 8843, correct? Probably. And, yeah, keep going. And you can also file the prior years with the same form. You don't need a new form for each year you missed. Is that right? Uh, you could use the 2020 form for each of the other years, but I, I wouldn't recommend that. Go get, go to the irs.gov, irs.gov, go there and get the pr appropriate year form for each of the 8843s. Let me share screen, just put that down there so everybody's got it. Hold on. Um, so a very good website to go to for information for international students is, here we go, irs.gov. You can get all the forms there. Go get your 8843 for each of the years that you're missing. Go get one for 2019, for 2018, et cetera, et cetera, and file them separately. Follow the instructions, file them separately. Don't make it easy for the immigration people to say, oh, we don't see your 2019 8843, therefore you're not in compliance. Don't make it that, e don't make it that easy. File each year separately. We might be erring on the side of caution, but that's what I recommend. Sounds good. Um, if I receive tuition remission as part of a TA ship, do I need to submit a 1042S? You don't do the 1042S, it comes to you. That's the school does that, or whoever's paying that scholarship or that reimbursement of whatever it is that they're right. paying, that comes from the, pay, the payor. And that, and the deadline for that is March 15th? You should get it by March 15th. That's the Got latest, it. right? Okay. All right. Um, it says here, you're required to upload a signed consent form 14446, form 13614-NR and W2 form in order to make an appointment at Turp Tax. Where do I get these forms? You should be able to get them online at terptaxumd.org. Uh, terp I'll show that before we finish, but you should be able to get it from, right from them. Should be there. Okay. And if, if not, make the appointment and let, let them know when you're making the appointment. Oh, I know they have to put that up to get the appointment maybe, but it should be on there. If they're still having trouble, uh, Debbie, after this, send them my email, send everybody my email address and they can contact me that way. I can make sure things But don't work. contact Sam until you've tried it because I went and it's on there. So oh, please, great. Sam's time is very, very valuable yeah. for all of us. So let's very be kind. <laughs> my time's okay. valuable at least until April 15th. 
All right, thank you. Next question. Do we have steps to be followed somewhere for filing taxes as an NR student? What does that mean steps? Like what they should do? Um, I, I guess just like an instruct, some instructions. Uh, IRS.gov, the forms are there. They have instructions for each form. The 1040 NR has a group of instructions. I would actually uh, take whoever asked that question and say, yeah, go to the IRS.gov, look at the 1040 NR instructions, and then you tell me whether you're not, you should come to Terp Tax, okay? Because when you see those instructions, you might say, oh, I have the time for this, but the, they, the hours that they'll tell you it might take you to do your return might be like a hundred hours. So, yeah. <laughs> you'll see. Okay, good suggestion. Go to Terp Tax. Um, here's someone who says, my employer doesn't know which form to provide. So what shall I tell him, W-2? Yeah, I, I think W-2 is certainly the safest when it comes to an F-1 or J-1 status. So I would definitely default to that. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, my paycheck consists of deductions for California state employee deduction tax, but I worked remotely from Maryland. Do I need to still file any state tax for California? If your W-2 shows that they withheld California tax, you absolutely want to file a California state tax return. You can get that money back. Okay. Yeah. I have received a scholarship in Germany during 2020. Is that taxable under a treaty in the US? I am a resident alien for tax purposes. Oh, resident alien. Okay, so now you have, now you got a problem. <laughs> uh, most likely uh, you're gonna need to consult to see how much you got, what was it used for to see if any of it's, if any, here's the simple rule. If any of it was used for your living expenses outside of tuition, fees required by the school and supplies required by the school, if it was used for room and board, if it was used for anything to help you do research, that's not part of a research uh, degree, part of your degree program, most likely you will have to pay tax on it, but you need to consult the treaty because maybe, maybe, maybe it's still not taxable here in the US. So that was, uh, that one doesn't fall squarely in the answers we were giving you before. That tr that's treaty is gonna have to be consulted for that. Okay, thank you. Um, I am filing as a resident. Do I have to show my property outside of the US, even if I'm not earning any income from that? You, if you're filing as a resident, you need to declare uh, certain investments that you have overseas. If it's just real estate, like if it's a rental property, you do not have to declare that. If there's no income coming from it, for sure you're okay. If there is rental income, you do have to report that here in the US as a resident. Remember again, residents worldwide, spoke about that in the beginning, worldwide income. Okay, thank there's you. A, there's two hands raised. Maybe we should get to those. Maybe more. I don't know how many more hands are raised. So Nicholas, we go with you. Yeah, actually, actually, my my question was was the question about the scholarship. So I haven't read the the, the treaty in, in in detail, but maybe to follow up. So in 2019, I get got the same thing, and I I went to H and R block to ask them whether do I have to file and they said no I don't have to file so maybe I have to look into the details the the other question I actually had is um, if I may uh, I was uh, so so far I always uh, I am married and my wife is here also on J1 but she's non-resident and I'm resident alien for tax purposes so even if I say married filling separately our deduction must match but they they cannot possibly match because she's she cannot put any deduction essentially because of a tax treaty. So that means I should file single. Uh, yeah, you should file single or you should definitely take a look at whether doing the joint return is ben more beneficial to mm -hmm. you, to her particularly. You okay, check, check uh, that I, I out. See. It might be beneficial to you too because uh, the standard deduction is twice as much if you file jointly. So I would definitely look into that. Right. Okay. All right. Great, thank you. Let's go back to the chat. Um, my employer wants me to work part-time as an independent contractor. However, I am on an F-1 visa and I'll work on CPT. What status should I tell my employer to change that to? 
So again, uh, first step is to, to explore whether under your particular CPT, this type of work is allowed. Uh, I'm not, again, I'm not an expert in that, so I can't answer that. But on the theory that normally it's not allowed, then you would ask them to classify you as an employee. If they, we didn't get into the details of what's the difference between independent contractor and employee. So they may, it may be that you are an employee. An employee is somebody they have control over. They give you the supplies. They tell you when to work. They tell you how to work. They give, maybe they, um, they, they give you the software to work with. Chances are that if the more control they have of you, the more you are really an employee and they should classify you that way anyway. But uh, if you, don't have the time to research your particular immigration status, just see if they can't just put you on as an employee and make it simple. Okay, thank you, Sam. Can you clarify whether all students should get the 1042S or only those with fellowships? So the it's interesting, not everybody will get them. Uh, even if you have a fellowship, there's a, light, there's a possibility you won't get one. It all depends on uh, what the, how the university looks at it. If the university sees that they've made these payments to you and they are um, not withholding taxes and they're not withholding taxes because it's clearly not taxable, they may not give you one. If they're not withholding taxes because of a treaty, they'll pr they will give you one. Uh, if they do withhold taxes, you absolutely will get one from them. So we, we they, the HR department at the University of Maryland is actually really good. I don't know if anybody is from is watching from here, but in case you are, you're really good. Uh, and you can, you can rely on whether you get one from them or not as, as to knowing for sure if it's been done right. All right, sounds good. We've got three minutes left. So we'll just take a couple of more questions. Again, um, I will be sending out the recording and the slides um, this afternoon, along with how to schedule an appointment with TurpTax. And um, I remember that as a free service, so please use it. Okay, next question. I am paying student loans in India. Can these be included in deductions? Probably not. If you're non-resident, probably not. Yeah. Okay. Um, I read online about 1040 NR versus 1040 NR EZ. What's the difference? Easy is easy to do. That's all it is. It's, uh, and, and most software programs will figure out which one you can use based on the instructions that accompany each of those forms. Okay, thank you. Um, I understand 1042S will be mailed by March 15th. When will 1098T be sent out? That is by the end of February uh, at the latest. So you should get that early March. All right, next question. Can you please talk about how to file state tax returns? State is a little more complex because uh, since you most likely will be considered resident, so you have to look at yourself a different way. If you're like, again, F1, J1, you're gonna be, and you're in that state for 183 days, you'll be considered a resident. You can, if you, let's say you get your 1040NR done on your own, you can most likely, electronically file that in the same software system that you're using. If you're using a software system or you can go to the state website, most of them allow you to um, punch in your information for an electronic filing as well. All right, thank you, Sam. Boy, this Terp, has been a- Terp, uh, Terp, Terp Tax does the states also. Very good. All right, I, I'm, I regret that we are not able to address everyone's questions. I, I see that there are several more, but you, we're not leaving you hanging. You can schedule an appointment at TurpTax for free assistance. Again, I will be sending that out um, along with a recording of this presentation and, um, and all of the slides. So thank you everyone for your patience and please forgive us for not getting to you, but you, uh, you've you got help after this. Let me say, so, one, let me, let me, let me say one more thing regarding Terp Tax. Uh, I will double check and see if there's, uh, there pro most websites have like contact us. I think they have that. I'll double check that we have that set up. It's a new website, so I got to double check. But that way, if you just contact us, I'll make sure that you can 
ask questions through contact us rather than have to sign up for an appointment if that's not where you're holding. If you just have a question, uh, I'll see that we have that set up so we can get an, an answer to you. And that way, if you didn't get your question answered today, you can do it that way as well. Okay, that would be great, Sam. Uh, I'll make sure that I put that in the follow-up email to everyone who registered. Great. So, Sam, can't thank you enough for sharing your time and talent. Gosh, you, you are so good to our students. And um, I know you've got a great group uh, at TurpTax um, making all this free service possible. So thank you, thank you, thank you for doing what you do. Um, and thank you to ISSS and the Graduate School for co-hosting today's workshop. And uh, good luck with your taxes. Remember that deadline is April 15th. And uh, watch out for the next grad alting workshop. I'll put that in the follow-up email. So everyone have a great week. Enjoy some sunshine today. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.